Minneapolis to spend $6.4 million to recruit more police officers Minneapolis Minneapolis is planning to spend $6.4 million to hire dozens of police officers. At a time when some city council members and activist groups have been advocating to replace the police department following George Floyd's death, the city council voted unanimously Friday to approve the additional funding that police requested. The department says it only has 638 officers available to work, roughly 200 fewer than usual. An unprecedented number of officers quit or went on extended medical leave after Floyd's death and the unrest that followed, which included the burning of a police precinct with new recruit classes. The city anticipates it will have 674 officers available at the end of the year, with another 28 in the hiring process the Star Tribune reported. Floyd, a black man who was handcuffed, died May 25 after former police officer Derek Chauvin, who is white, pressed his knee against Floyd's neck even as he said he couldn't breathe. Floyd's death sparked protests and led to a nationwide reckoning on race. Chauvin is charged with second-degree murder and manslaughter and is scheduled for trial March 8. Three other former officers are charged with aiding and abetting, and are scheduled for trial in August. While there have been calls to dismantle the department after Floyd's death, some residents have begged the city to hire more officers, citing longer response times and an increase in violent crime. Days before the city council vote, Mayor Jacob Frey and Police Chief Medaria Arredondo promised to update the application process for police recruits to include questions about whether they have lived in Minneapolis, have degrees in criminology, social work, psychology or counseling, and whether they volunteer or participate in programs such as the Police Activities League. Deputy Police Chief Amelia Huffman said they hope the change will help us to really feel confident that we are recruiting the kinds of candidates we want right from the beginning. Meanwhile, three city council members have proposed replacing the police department with a public safety department that would include law enforcement and other services. Yes, for Minneapolis. A coalition of local community groups is also collecting signatures to try to get a similar proposal on the November ballot. The Star Tribune reported the Yes for Minneapolis committee is being fueled by a half-million-dollar grant from the Washington, D.C.-based group Open Society Policy Center, which is associated with billionaire George Soros. Organizers hope to collect 20,000 signatures by March 31st. We have a policing system that doesn't work for us and we need alternatives, said Rachel Bean, who signed the petition Saturday. I'm a social worker and I feel like we have lots of tools that we could try to create more community safety. The petition would remove police department language from the city's charter and create a public health-focused Department of Public Safety including licensed peace officers if necessary to fulfill the responsibilities of the department. Trump acquitted for second time following historic Senate impeachment trial The Senate acquitted former President Donald Trump in his second impeachment trial Saturday, voting that Trump was not guilty of inciting the deadly January 6 riot at the U.S. Capitol, but the verdict amounted to a bipartisan rebuke of the former president with seven Republicans finding him guilty. The final vote was 57 guilty to 43 not guilty, short of the 67 guilty votes needed to convict. Held exactly one month after the House impeached Trump. The number of Republican senators who voted against Trump ended up higher than even what Trump's legal team had anticipated, marking a stark departure from the first impeachment trial last year when only one Republican senator, Mitt Romney of Utah, found Trump guilty. This time, Republicans sends Richard Burr of North Carolina, Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Ben Sass of Nebraska, Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania and Romney voted to convict Trump. Perhaps the biggest surprise was Burr, the former Senate Intelligence Committee chairman who led the Senate's Russia investigation. After he voted earlier in the week that the trial was unconstitutional, 
Both Burr and Toomey are retiring from the Senate at the end of 2022. Burr said that while he believed the trial was unconstitutional, he decided to put that aside after the Senate voted Tuesday that the trial was constitutional and should proceed. As I said on January 6, the president bears responsibility for these tragic events. The evidence is compelling that President Trump is guilty of inciting an insurrection against a co-equal branch of government and that the charge rises to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Therefore, I have voted to convict Burr said in a statement, the vote underscored the obvious dilemma Trump has posed to most congressional Republicans in the aftermath of the January 6 riots with many Republican senators eager for the party to move on from the former president but grappling with the reality that he still holds sway over the party's base. It's a dichotomy that the party will, will face heading into the 2022 midterm elections when it seeks to regain control of Congress. And the 2024 GOP presidential primary, most Senate Republicans sided with the constitutionality argument in their votes to acquit, allowing them to avoid casting judgment based on Trump's conduct. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell offered a blistering criticism of Trump's actions on the Senate floor after the vote. But McConnell said he voted to acquit because he did not believe convicting an ex-president was constitutional. The Senate's decision today does not condone anything that happened on or before the terrible day, McConnell said. It simply shows that senators did what the former president failed to do. We put our constitutional duty first. Let impeachment manager Rep. Jamie Raskin of Maryland hailed the vote, saying it was the most bipartisan impeachment in history. The bottom line is that we convinced a big majority in the Senate of our case, Raskin said. Trump's attorney Michael Van Der Veen said the former president was vindicated by Saturday's vote to acquit him. He had a good day in court today. He was vindicated. He was found not guilty, Van Der Veen said after the vote. The political witch hunt that they had, that the Democrats had thrown at him was defeated. So he should feel quite pleased. Vote comes after surprise call for witnesses closing the House manager's argument. Raskin played the senator's sense of history in urging them to convict the former president for inciting the rioters to attack the Capitol and failing to stop them after the violence unfolded. This is almost certainly how you will be remembered by history, Raskin said. That might not be fair. It really might not be fair. But none of us can escape the demands of history and destiny right now. Our reputations and our legacy will be inextricably intertwined with what we do here. And with how you exercise your oath to do impartial justice, Van Der Veen argued that Trump did not incite a riot that had been pre-planned again repeating the falsehood that the rioters represented both left and right fringe groups. When video evidence and court documents conclusively show that the riot was perpetrated by Trump supporters. The final vote came quickly on the fifth day of the Senate trial after a surprise Democratic request for witnesses earlier Saturday threw the trial briefly into chaos. The Senate voted 55-45 to 45 to consider witnesses with five Republican joining Democrats, after the managers said they wanted to hear from Rep. Jamie Herrera Butler, a Washington Republican who had told CNN new details about House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy's phone call with Trump on January 6. But after several hours of intense negotiations between Senate leaders, the managers and Trump's legal team, the managers agreed to enter Herrera Butler's statement into the trial record as evidence and move forward without hearing from witnesses. On Saturday morning, Democratic senators had expected House managers to move past witnesses on to closing arguments and a final vote. But Raskin announced when the trial got underway that the managers wanted to subpoena Herrera Butler about her knowledge of McCarthy's phone call. Herrera Butler one of the ten House Republicans who voted to impeach Trump last month confirmed in a statement Friday that McCarthy said the president told him on the call, Well, Kevin, I guess these people are more upset about the election than you are. Concerns that calling witnesses would backfire House Democrats ultimately decided to cut a deal over witnesses because of the 
unpredictability of how that would turn out and fears that doing so could backfire and undermine their case. According to multiple sources with knowledge of the discussions, Democrats didn't make a decision to call Herrera Butler to testify until shortly before the proceedings began Saturday morning. Sources said, the managers debated until nearly 3 a.m. Eastern Time Saturday morning about whether to seek witnesses following the newly revealed details of the McCarthy call. Managers had their eyes set on at least two possible witnesses, Herrera Butler and Rep. John Katko of New York, who also voted to impeach. According to a source with direct knowledge of the deliberations, a spokesman for Herrera Butler said she would have been willing to testify, among the variety of reasons they did not go forward. They were warned bluntly by Senate Democrats that moving forward on witnesses could stall the Senate since the Trump team could move forward with any number of motions for witnesses. Each motion would require two hours of debate. That warning was delivered Saturday to the Democratic impeachment managers by Delaware Senator Chris Coons who said he was conveying what Republicans had told him, according to the source along with a Coons aide. Trump's lawyers had responded to Raskin's request by threatening to call 100 witnesses, and his legal team quickly had prepared a list of 300 potential names Saturday. As they deliberated until the early morning hours, House Democratic managers consulted with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The first source said, according to a Democrat familiar with the matter, the impeachment managers did not tell top Senate Democrats they wanted witnesses until five minutes before the proceedings. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer didn't even know until that point. But he told the managers Friday night and Saturday morning that Senate Democrats would support whatever decision the mangers made, and reiterated the point on a caucus call Saturday, they ultimately settled on submitting Herrera Butler's statement to the record as long as Trump's attorney made a public statement agreeing to submit it as evidence. The reason, they believed that pushing forward with her testimony would add little beyond her statement and could potentially cost them GOP support while dragging out the proceedings further. The sources told CNN the Democrats were uncertain how Herrera Butler's testimony would come across after she was subject to cross-examination, with some concerns that she could potentially undercut their case if there were holes in her account. Moreover, if they called other witnesses, it could also backfire. For instance, McCarthy could provide testimony that defended Trump, undermining what they believe is a rock-solid case that Trump incited the January 6 insurrection at the Capitol, the sources said. Plus witnesses would not ultimately change GOP senators' minds, they concluded, while hearing from witnesses could bog down the Senate for weeks and imperil President Joe Biden's agenda. We could have had 5,000 witnesses, Raskin told reporters after the vote. The point is that no number of witnesses demonstrating that Donald Trump continued to incite the insurrectionists even after the invasion of the Capitol would convince them. They wouldn't be convinced. GOP senators focus on constitutional argument while there was plenty of drama over witnesses at the trial Saturday. The reality for Democrats was that additional evidence was still unlikely to change the final outcome of the trial. The final vote was already telegraphed earlier in the week. The GOP senators who voted the trial of a former president was unconstitutional said that was what would determine their final vote, leaving the Senate well. Short of the 17 GOP senators needed for conviction, many Republicans like McConnell criticized Trump's conduct but said they voted to acquit because of jurisdictional issue. Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, who is not seeking re-election next year, said, My decision today in no way condones the president's conduct. On the contrary, it is keeping an oath to the Constitution that I believe the president did not keep on January 6. The six Republicans who voted the trial was constitutional all voted to convict Trump. Joining the ten House Republicans who voted to impeach him in the House last month, Several of those Republican senators, Collins, Murkowski, 
Romney and Cassidy pressed Trump's lawyers during the Senate's question-and-answer session Friday over the actions Trump took and failed to take when he learned about the riots unfolding in. Tweeted Pence was lacking courage while he was being evacuated from the Senate. Burr was the only senator who voted the trial was unconstitutional to also find Trump guilty. For the Republican senators who voted to convict Trump, they could face political consequences. As House lawmakers who impeached him have been censured by local GOP officials. Murkowski is the only senator who voted to convict who is running for re-election next year. And told reporters afterward that her vote had nothing to do with politics. I'm sure that there are many Alaskans that are very dissatisfied with my vote. And I'm sure there are many Alaskans proud of my vote, Murkowski said. And I'm sure that that is the same of every 100 of us that just cast a vote in there. Because the country is split. And the country is divided. And the country has chosen sides in a way as we can see, can be very aggressive and can lead to violence. These Republicans voted to convict Trump in his second impeachment trial. Seven Republican senators joined with Democrats in voting to convict former President Donald Trump at the conclusion of his second impeachment trial. Trump has been acquitted of inciting an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6. The GOP defections nevertheless stand as a sharp rebuke of the former president. The Republicans who voted for conviction were Richard Burr of North Carolina, Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Mitt Romney of Utah, Ben Sass of Nebraska, Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. The vote was 43 not guilty to 57 guilty, short of the 67 guilty vote needed to convict Trump. How Republican senators explained their votes to convict Richard Burr, who is not running for re-election next year, said, in part, in a statement. The president promoted unfounded conspiracy theories to cast doubt on the integrity of a free and fair election because he did not like the results. As Congress met to certify the election results, the president directed his supporters to go to the Capitol to disrupt the lawful proceedings required by the Constitution. When the crowd became violent, the president used his office to first inflame the situation instead of immediately calling for an end to the assault. He went on to say, as I said on January 6, the president bears responsibility for these tragic events. The evidence is compelling that President Trump is guilty of inciting an insurrection against a co-equal branch of government and that the charge rises to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Therefore, I have voted to convict Bill Cassidy said in a brief statement, our constitution and our country is more important than any one person. I have voted to convict President Trump because he is guilty, Susan Collins explained her vote in a speech on the Senate floor, saying, in part, my vote in this trial stems from my own oath and duty to defend the Constitution of the United States. The abuse of power and betrayal of his oath by President Trump meet the constitutional standard of high crimes and misdemeanors and for those reasons, I voted to convict Lisa Murkowski, who is slated to face voters again in her state as soon as 2022 told reporters later Saturday that she understands her decision to vote to convict Trump could come with electoral consequences but argued she made a decision she thought was best. It's not about me, Murkowski said in part. It's not about me and my life, my job, this is really about what we stand for. And if I can't say what I believe that our president should stand for, then why should I ask Alaskans to, Mitt Romney said, in part, in a statement. President Trump incited the insurrection against Congress by using the power of his office to summon his supporters to Washington on January 6 and urging them to march on the Capitol during the counting of electoral votes. He did this despite the obvious and well-known threats of violence that day. President Trump also violated his oath of office by failing to protect the Capitol, the vice president and others in the Capitol, Ben Sass said, in part, in a lengthy statement on his vote, on election night 2014. I promised Nebraskans I'd always vote my conscience even if it was against the partisan stream. 
in my first speech here in the Senate in November 2015. I promise to speak out when a president, even of my own party, exceeds his or her powers. I cannot go back on my word, and Congress cannot lower our standards on such a grave matter, simply because it is politically convenient. I must vote to convict Pat Toomey, who is not running for re-election next year. Told reporters on a call later Saturday that Trump will be remembered throughout history as the president who resorted to non-legal steps to try to hold on to power. Rejecting the arguments from Trump's defense team that the former president's conduct was protected under the First Amendment and that the trial itself was unconstitutional because he was out of office said, no president, or anyone else, has the First Amendment right to incite a violent attack on our government, and that there was an overwhelming body of evidence that suggests the trial was constitutionally permissible, noting that the Constitution gives the Senate the sole power to try all impeachments. Louisiana Republican Party censures Cassidy following vote to convict Trump The Louisiana Republican Party swiftly moved Saturday to censure GOP Sen. Bill Cassidy after he voted earlier in the day to convict former President Donald Trump in his second impeachment trial. The executive committee of the Republican Party of Louisiana has unanimously voted to censure Senator Bill Cassidy for his vote cast earlier today to convict former President Donald J. Trump on the impeachment charge, the state party said in a statement. Cassidy was one of only seven GOP senators who joined with all Senate Democrats in voting to convict Trump, but the 57 guilty votes fell well short of the 67 needed to convict the former president. Republican Sens. Richard Burr of North Carolina, Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Mitt Romney of Utah, Ben Sass of Nebraska and Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania joined in voting that Trump was guilty of inciting the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6. Cassidy, in a brief statement following his vote Saturday, said, Our Constitution and our country is more important than any one person. I voted to convict President Trump because he is guilty. CNN has reached out to Cassidy for comment on the state party censure. Cassidy is the latest Republican to face backlash from his home party. As the National Republican Party faces its own internal conflicts in the wake of the November election last week, Sass faced a censure effort by the Nebraska GOP, while at least 10 House Republicans have faced backlash, including Rep. Liz Cheney of Wyoming, a lifelong ideological conservative. Cheney, the no. 3 Republican in the House, fought off a challenge to her leadership post from members of her own party after she voted to impeach Trump. Louisiana State Senator Stuart Cathy Jr., a Republican who represents parts of northern Louisiana, said later Saturday that the local Republican anger directed at Cassidy has been quick as many Louisianans are upset. Disappointed, we elected Senator Cassidy back in November, dot, and we overwhelming sent him back to D.C. along with President Trump, said the state senator. His constituents thought we were sending him there with a lot of those same ideals, so today's vote really caught people off guard. Cassidy won re-election in November, meaning he won't face voters for almost another six years. Cathy said that hasn't dampened the reaction. I am State Senator Cathy and he is United States Senator Cassidy, said Cathy, who remains closely aligned to Trump. I am getting emails saying, I can't believe you are doing that. I just politely say, I think you've mistaken me. Cuomo's office hid nursing home COVID-19 data out of fear of Trump administration The Office of New York Gov. Andrew Cuomo confirmed Friday the contents of a recording that shows the governor and his team withheld from state legislators the true number of coronavirus deaths at New York nursing homes. Out of fear it could be used against them by the Trump administration. The governor's top aide, Melissa DeRosa, confirmed the contents of the recording of a September conference call with Democratic state legislators, first reported by the New York Post. 
in which she admits that the governor's office withheld the numbers due to concerns they would be used against us by the Justice Department under then-President Donald Trump. The figures were ultimately revealed last month as part of an investigation into COVID-19 nursing home deaths by the office of New York Attorney General Tish James. Sources tell ABC News that Albany lawmakers will begin discussing whether to strip Cuomo of some his coronavirus emergency powers in the aftermath of the revelation. It's unclear whether the leaders of either the Assembly or the Senate would be on board with such a move. More, number of NY nursing home residents lost to COVID-19 underreported by up to 50%. Probe says, he starts tweeting that we killed everyone in nursing homes, DeRosa said of Trump on the conference call recording, a transcript of which was provided by DeRosa to ABC News. He starts going after, New Jersey Governor Phil, Murphy, starts going after, California Governor Gavin, Newsom, starts going after, Michigan Gov. Gretchen Whitmer. He directs the Department of Justice to do an investigation into us. And basically, we froze. Because then we were in a position where we weren't sure if what numbers we were going to give to the Department of Justice or what we give to you guys was going to be used against us, DeRosa told the legislators. We weren't sure if there was going to be an investigation. In a statement released Friday, DeRosa said, I was explaining that when we received the DOJ inquiry we needed to temporarily set aside the legislature's request to deal with the federal request first. We informed the houses of this at the time, her statement said. We were comprehensive and transparent in our responses to the DOJ and then had to immediately focus our resources on the second wave and vaccine rollout. Republicans immediately seized on the admission by an aide to the Democratic governor, who was speaking on the call to fellow Democrats who hold the Senate majority. Governor Cuomo and his administration must be investigated from top to bottom and he must be stripped of his emergency powers, New York Senate Minority Leader Rob Ort said on Twitter. More. As more nursing homes receive COVID-19 vaccine. Relatives demand greater access to residents. The spokesperson for Assembly Speaker Carl Hista confirmed that Cuomo's office asked for more time last year in compiling nursing home data after an August request. The report released last month on the results of the state attorney general's investigation concluded that a larger number of nursing home residents died from COVID-19 than the New York State. Department of Health's published nursing home data reflected, due in part to many nursing home deaths being counted as hospital deaths. The number of nursing home residents who died from COVID-19 may have been undercounted by as much as 50 percent, the report said. The probe also found that a directive from Cuomo based on guidance from the State Department of Health to admit COVID-19 patients into nursing homes in the early days of the pandemic may have put residents at increased risk of harm. In March, as cases surged, Cuomo issued an order that required nursing homes to accept COVID-19 patients being discharged from 